I was sitting in front of my my television one day, one evening, and I was just watching something on television. I don't even remember what the program was. But all of a sudden, a, a screen opened up in my mind. That's the only way I can, I can describe it, because I saw scenes as though I were looking at a screen, and yet I was within the scenes and could feel myself within the scenes. And I was transported back to Germany of 19, 1938, somewhere, somewhere around the 1st of November of 1938, in Frankfurt, Germany, on Judenstrasse. I was a keeper of a small shop of art and books. And I can see and could remember the placement of every book and every record in that store. That little store was my delight. And I sold mostly books on Judaica, but I also sold a lot of records because I loved to listen to the great opera singers of the time, Caruso and De Luca and all of the great singers. I remember then when the Nazis came, it was November 9th, 1938. It was the day that would be later known in history as Kristallnacht because they came and broke all of the windows in the Jewish shopkeepers. They threw books, uh, threw bricks rather, into my bookstore and they marched in and began carrying all the books out into the Judenstrasse where they set them on fire. They carried all of my records out, they destroyed the shop and uh, finally they carried me out. And as I'm seeing this on this internal visual screen, I'm also remembering it and re-experiencing it. And they took me and hundreds of others of my friends to the city jail in Frankfurt. And they were it was terribly overcrowded. We were just thrown in there like animals. And we did not know what was going to become of us. We thought. Uh, this might be it. Maybe it's going to, this is where we're going to die right here. And there was no, there were no toiletry facilities. People were urinating on other people. It was, it looked like the end for all of us. But then at some point, I don't know how long it was, I lost track of time, maybe a, maybe a week, they came and they let us out of jail and they took us to boxcars. And at first they told us that, that we were going to be uh, taken out of Germany and let free. And we were crammed into those boxcars like animals. I mean, it was more crowded than any subway on New York City. And the cars, I remember the cars lurching along, the feeling of staggering into other people who, who stank. And it was, a, it was a horrible ride. Finally, it ended after it seemed like two or three hours. And we got out, and they, they let us out. I asked the guard, when I stepped off of the car, I asked the guard where we were, and he said, das ist Buchenwald. This is Buchenwald. And there was a huge iron gate there. And on the iron gate, written in iron, uh, were the funniest words. It said, jedem aus seine which literally means uh, to each his own, but it really meant you'll get along here as well as you can according to your own strength. Because Buchenwald was a work camp. No one was gassed at Buchenwald. We were worked to death. So the very first thing they did was to separate us. At first there were no women. The first, the first people to come in 1938 were all men. And they brought us into these barracks, which were really like old broken down chicken coops with just slats for, for beds to lay on. Three years later, they brought women and children and they were separated from us and taken to other places that we never knew what, they ha what happened to them. And then we were set to work in mines we were digging all sorts of things in mines, and some people were put to work in making gunpowder for shells for the, for the Nazis. But I worked mostly in the mines. And what I remember so 
vividly was the effect that the work had on me. It was wearing me down. And everybody else was having a similar effect. And the closed, the closed environment in those chicken coops where we could not breathe began to eat away at all of us and to uh, hurt our lung, uh, our lung capacities. And finally, after a, a couple of it was at least a couple of years of this, I began to experience heart failure and inability to breathe. And eventually, I died from that. Many other of my fellows died around the same time. And we lifted out of our bodies, just as you've heard on near-death experiences. We lifted out of our bodies and above those camps. And it was such a first. At first, it was such an exhilarating feeling to be out of this body, which was so mangled and in which it was so difficult to breathe and to be free, and not only to be free, but to be free above the camps. You know, this was an incredible feeling of exhilaration. And we went on, ascended through. I don't remember going through a tunnel, but at, there came a time when we came into a completely different dimension. Uh, you could call it the bardo if you want, if you're Buddhist, but it was another dimension. The atmosphere was had a sort of a blue-gray tint to it, and we were met by beings of light, angels I considered them, and they came to us and acted as nurses because our our emotional, astral, and celestial bodies had been mangled by the treatment that we had received. We literally needed spiritual nursing, just as if we had been physically in a hospital and needed physical attention. The angels actually acted as nurses for us to bind our wounds, to heal our spiritual bodies that had been ravaged along with our physical bodies. And it was such a soothing place. There was this wonderful, loving light that was there in this environment. And then all of a sudden, spectacularly, there came a burst of light that was so intense that the, a, a thousand arc welders lights could not imitate it. It was in this, this enormous burst of light and from that burst of light came a being. And the being was Yeshua. The being was Jesus. He had come to us to minister to us. And that meant so much to us because we had denied him. We had called him terrible names. We'd called him a bastard. We'd, we had reviled him so deeply. And he held none of that against us. He came to us and he loved on us. He let us hug him. His smile was so incredibly bright. We loved him then. And we knew he was Yeshua HaMashiach. He was Jesus, our Messiah. We were all given choices then, whether we wanted to go up into higher dimensions and stay there for a while, or whether we wanted to reincarnate quite quickly. And after having seen Yeshua, I made the choice. I wanted to reincarnate quite quickly. I asked two things. I asked first that I be allowed to incarnate into a Christian family. And secondly, I ask, if it would just be possible, just if it were possible, could I please be allowed to sing like the men on the records that I listened to in my shop? And he smiled so greatly it lit up the whole scene. And the next thing I know, I was a baby, and they were picking and poking at me and saying, look how cute the baby is. And, and they were calling me Joe Boy. Look how cute Joe Boy is. And, and then I became Joseph Shore. And the interesting thing was that the terrible conditions that I suffered in the camp, a congestive heart failure, lung failure, became imprinted on me in this incarnation. So I was born with heart disease and born with lung disease as something yet I had to struggle with some lessons there I needed to learn from it. And the continuity of life is amazing. The lessons that we 
need to learn go over many, many lifetimes. We can't possibly learn them all in one. And so I grew up as this sickly kid who couldn't do anything because he had this mysterious heart disease. It was in a small town with a small town country doctor who didn't understand what was wrong with the heart. And I was 19 years old before they decided to take me to Houston Methodist Hospital and let the great Michael DeBakey look at me and see what was wrong with me. And he, we went there, he did, he found that I was born with this rare disease known as coarctation syndrome. <clears throat> it was a birth defect of the heart and the blood vessel system. They partially corrected that, only partially, and sent me on my way. Said, okay, do your best, you know. But they didn't give me any really readout on the actual disease and what I could expect and further, further surgeries, whatever. So I did that. I went out, did the best I could. But something happened to me after that surgery, or during it, I suspect, because they apparently had difficult time getting my heart started again. Because I had a near-death experience at that, at that time. And it wasn't a full-blown one. What it was was a, an out-of-body experience. And they wheeled my body into the ICU while I was still under the anesthesia. <clears throat> And, you know, it takes about 12 to 24 hours for you to come out of that anesthesia. So there my body was sitting there in the ward, but I was perfectly awake and calm and looking at everything. I was sitting on my body's left shoulder. I was just about the size of, po of a point of light or a camera focus. I, I didn't have any spiritual body like Casper the Friendly Ghost or anything. I was just there. My consciousness was awake. I could see 360 degrees. I could see the body. I could see the nurses, but they couldn't see me. But the, the interesting thing was that I could see their thoughts and feel their feelings. And uh, to make a long story short, that whole experience opened me up further because in, as a boy I had always been somewhat psychic and had the ability to have visions. I didn't know that was rare. I just thought everybody could do that. But after this near-death experience, all of that was very much heightened. And uh, a friend of mine about that time came to see me to see how I was recovering. And I could see into him. That was the thing. I could see into him. And I could see that he was full of something I didn't exactly know what it was, but then I figured it out. It was love. My friend Glenn was filled with love. That was amazing to me because I'd grown up in the Baptist church. I'd grown up in religion, but I had never experienced this love. You know, I went all through my years in Sunday school, and I never really experienced the love that is Jesus. But I found it in Glenn, and I wanted it. I told him right then and there I wanted it. And he said, great, let's do it. I asked Jesus to come into my heart and to be my guide for the rest of my life. And he did. And that same love came into me and it's been with me ever since. At first, I thought I wanted to be a theologian. But while I was in seminary, I got very disgruntled. I didn't feel like it was the, my right place. But I did have a friend there who was an opera buff and he listened to opera morning, noon and night and as, as his friend I listened with him. I, there was something about those great voices that hooked me and made me remember something that I couldn't quite remember and I started doing my theology studies while listening to opera. But I was very disgruntled, I knew I didn't belong there and one evening a voice said to me, a very familiar old voice said to me, your characters can be your sermons your audience can be your congregation. The theater can be your church. Now go put feet to your faith. Well, this was not easy to follow, but I did that. I left seminary, I got a job. When I wasn't working, I was listening to opera. <coughs> and one day, I just decided to open my mouth to see if I could make a sound like one of those guys. And out came this operatic voice, which I've carried around ever since. 
one of my friends came by and said, you've got quite a voice, you should enter the Metropolitan Opera auditions. And I didn't know what they were, but I said, sure, show me how to, show me how to apply and I'll be happy to do that. And I did. I went down to the auditions and they, everybody just fell all over me like I was a great discovery. Uh, the Santa Fe Opera came up to me and offered me a contract. Uh, the doors of opera swung open to me and for many years I, I was at the top of my profession, uh, voted best baritone in America and Canada in 1981. I sang the greatest roles that has ever been written like Macbeth, Rigoletto. So it was really a great fulfillment of the promise that Jesus had made to me when I, when I asked him if I could please be allowed to sing like the people on the records in my shop there in Frankfurt. And besides singing, I've also written many spiritual books. I'm a student of A Course in Miracles. I use that as my, my life guide. Uh, but the voice of Jesus has always been there in my head and always talks to me. I've channeled books from it. And so my life I've discovered is a journey of love from love and the focus of that journey is, has been and always will be Jesus and that's who I am.